None can see me. I am one with the shadows. I am one with the dark. I am one with my brothers. Despite the distance between us, we act as one body, one mind, one purpose. I stand atop a spire, preparing myself. The lights in the palace are bright. They dazzle all around, hiding me further. It nears the time I will strike. I can feel it. Like a shadow within a shadow, I am hidden. But I do not feel alone. I can almost feel my fallen brethren with me, guiding me. All of the Raven Guard who have ever existed before, they watch me, they help me. I am never alone. The grand doors are finally opened and the attendees of this luxurious ball begin to dribble out of the palace. I watch. I wait. I watch. I wait. My mark, the one assigned to me alone, processes down the many large stairs of the palace with an entourage of guards. They are well trained, and coverage of their lord is tight. A shot would be difficult in the extreme, as they are disposed. They believe he is untouchable. But tonight he will pay for his actions, his treachery. He is mine. I set the signal going and my brothers across the city signal that they too are ready. My foot depresses very smoothly on the detonator and the world explodes into light and fire and sound. Charges I had set across the courtyard nights before now roar into life and rubble is blasted above, around and below them. His men are shaken and the formation is disrupted for a mere moment as they react as all humans do to explosions and crouch just that little bit. I take my opportunity. The bullet flies true and embeds itself in the brow of my target. He does not reach the ground unattended, his nearest guard grabbing him as he falls only to see the red dot between the eyes and to know that he has failed. So let it be with all traitors. We shall come for you when you feel yourself most safe. None are protected if they turn from the Emperor's light. None. I stalk through the night, the shadows, repelling halfway down the spire to the allotted and agreed position. I am met less than a minute later by the land speeder. As it floats up to me, I, I jump inside and see the rest of my squad. Our lighter arm acquired, our jobs completed in this place, we head towards the next target. We silently skim over the city toward the place they believe strong, the place they think they are invulnerable. My brothers and I take up more positions atop the spires, always looking down, always wary. The guard is changing as we see they have been informed of the events of the palace. They rush about in disorder, scrambling to open top transports to be taken to key locations within the city, expecting this to be a prelude to a conventional assault. My squad and I act as one again. Our sniping rifles raised and aimed with precision, we shoot out the designated targets while our brethren in the assault squads prepare to fall on them like a murder of crows. The drivers of a half dozen transport are dealt with, and the collisions of their vehicles with walls and lampposts send scores of their men spilling out at speed across the thoroughfares, blocking them utterly. They are trapped. They are trapped and confused when our brothers fall amongst them. Lightning claws are deployed to lethal effect, as the enemy fall like wheat before the thresher. We were done here in 12.3 minutes, and then progress to our third target. We sow chaos. To prevent the greater chaos and horror of a protracted and bloody war, it is a mercy as much as an expedient. All across this world my brothers have enacted the same toll from these generals and lords who forget their place, who turn their back on the Imperium. In less than an hour of activity we have cut their head from the military and executive of this population. We do not blame the common man for the failings of their leaders, their slave masters, but they have now been warned. We will progress from here to their most important facilities and take them before the sun rises. This 
the surprise the emperor asks of us, his raven god, to watch, to wait, to listen, and then to act. We defend the Empyrean more than any know. We are the thing that comes from the night. We are the reason so many have remained loyal when they would have been tempted. We are the Emperor's Raven Guard. And from the darkness, we bring the Emperor's light. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, and I wish to introduce you to the forces and factions of the Weimar 40k universe. Today, we discuss one of the forces that so much points the grim and dark into what is almost universally known as the grim darkness of the future, the Raven Guard. For much of this entry, I will be leaning on existing wisdom, quoting direct from their new codex supplement. This is not out of fatigue or a lack of impulse or ardor. I just find that the codex is so new, the definitions and entries from Games Workshop so good that I could never match them. Why reinvent the wheel after all? But let us make no bones about it. In my mind, the Raven Guard are one of the legions closest to the very heart of the history, tragedy and splendor of the Warhammer setting. Their history is bleak, their demeanor dour, but through it all they are some of the most ardently loyal and are actually hopeful and shining bright of all of the Royalist forces. For despite residing in darkness, making a home of the shadows, theirs is a crusade of light. A war waged against the dying of the human spirit, against tyranny, against slavery, against chaos. For their every action, their every shot, blow or brawl, is executed to the one purpose only, the protection and emancipation of humanity from the evils that reside in the Raven Guard's home, the Dark. Many have said that the Emperor created each of his legions of Astartes, his space marines, to perform a very specific task. But from my reading of the law, which could be wrong of course, he is also built in overlapping roles and redundancies within his legions. Thus it is that the realm of the night, the darkness, is not only the purview of the night lords as some may think, nor is the subtlety and precision the domain of the alpha legion alone. In the raven guard is the counter to these forces. Where the darkness hides the night lords and allows them to bring terror and panic, the Raven Guard are truly one with the shadows. They are one with the night. Oh, how I wish I knew of a tale of a war within the shadows betwixt these two forces. But alas, I am ignorant of one. So if you do know of an instance, then please do enter this in the comments. For I never profess to know more than any old hand and implore our wonderful community to signpost me if they are privy to such an instance. If there is not one, then I suggest that in the future we may, as a collective community, forge our own narrative. For one is needed. Of this there can be no doubt. And what a battle it would be. Night Lords versus Raven Guard. I sincerely hope there is one out there. Now, I should lean on existing wisdom, but shall sum up with some of my own thoughts and observations, as meagre as they may be, at the end of this entry. I hope you will join me there. To quote... The Raven Guard are masters of the shadow arts. Striking from concealment, they wreak bloody destruction on the foe before withdrawing to ready another devastating blow. Commanded by Emperor and Primarch to safeguard mankind against the perils of a pitiless galaxy, they roam the stars unseen, bringing woe to heretics and oppressors, laying low myriad Xenos threats. With the Raven Guard tread, every shadow conceals the promise of death, a fate born on the blazing pinions of jump packs and delivered by darkened blades, roaring bolt rifles and the crackling arc of lightning claws. For the enemies of the Imperium there can be no escape, no refuge. There is only death, delivered from the darkness by warriors who see all and forgive nothing. Raven Guard armies seize victory through stealth and speed, advancing covertly to strike at the foe's most vulnerable points with the full array of weapons and war gear available to the Adeptus Astartes. Wherever you tread, tread lightly. We are closer than you think, and our blades are sharp. Caven Strike, Master of Shadows. As a shadow wills, 
The Raven Guard are masters of clandestine war, often achieving by stealth what others can claim only through brazen and costly onslaught. For the scions of Korax, furious frontal assaults mark the culmination rather than the commencement of a campaign. By the time open battle is joined, the Raven Guard's foes are already in disarray. Their leaders assassinated, their fortifications sabotaged, and their supply lines blazing beneath smoke-wreathed skies. Since their inception, the Raven Guard have been a fighting force more subtle than their brother Astartes. Not for their warriors, the blazonry and splendor of the Ultramarines and Blood Angels, nor the overt might of the Imperial Fists. Even during the Great Crusade, while other legions shone as bright symbols of unification and conquest, the Raven Guard of the 19th Legion, with the Emperor's hidden hand, hunting his foes from the shadows beyond Terra's ever-expanding light. So has the Raven Guard way of war remained. Assassination, crippling raids and misdirection are their chief weapons, their talons slicing at the foe's exposed underbelly as he lumbers to face a threat already vanished. Open warfare is wielded as the coup de grace, pursued to its bloody conclusion only once the prey has been bled to exhaustion by relentless strikes from the shadows. More so than most first founding chapters, the Raven Guard are shaped by the teachings of their Primarch and the legacies of decisions that he made many thousands of years ago. Much of the chapter's ancient history is lost, buried amidst the dusts of eons. The Raven Guard themselves preserve only those parts of their heritage that can be taught by indoctrination and doctrine, held carefully in stasis sealed archival vaults deep within their, their chapter monastery, or else inherited from their sire's gene seed. Still, though an observer might not understand the significance of what they see, they would have to take only the most perfunctory glance at the Battle Brothers of this mysterious chapter to see Korax's hand heavy upon them. Physically, though they lose none of the post-human strength of the Adeptus Astartes, the Raven Guard tend towards a tall and wiry build, often exhibiting a certain hollowness of their cheeks and watchfulness in their dark eyes that others find unsettling. This is in no way aided by the fact that the Battle Brothers of the Chapter often exhibit skin so pallid that the veins can be seen threading beneath it, offset by hair of a shocking midnight black. There seems little doubt that these physical characteristics echo those of Korax himself, though of course the only images that remain of the Primarch exist in stained glass, heroic frescoes or towering statuary wrought more often than not by one who has never even set eyes upon his gene sons. The Primarch's hand can also be seen in the combat doctrines and fighting styles key to the Raven Guard way of war. Through the trifold path that has been passed down through millennia of chapter tradition, the Raven Guard seek to master the disciplines of watchful precision, sudden ambush, and preternatural stealth. Their veterans are inevitably versed in all these subtleties, allowing them to wage war as apex predators that strike from the shadows to shatter their enemy's strength before the foe is even truly aware the fight has begun. In outlook and philosophy also, the Raven Guard are their Primarch's sons. Korax was ever a liberator, a deliverer who sought not glory, but rather the swift and efficient overthrow of tyrants and the salvation of the human race. Yet he was also said to have been withdrawn, secretive, and little given to the easy displays of charisma and camaraderie, so natural to, to some of his brothers. The Raven Guard have inherited both the good and the bad from their gene sire, and are viewed by the wider Imperium of the 41st millennium as shadowy and uncertain figures, regarded as much with fear as with hope. In one other way are the Raven Guard affected by the legacy of their sire. During the darkest days of the Horus Heresy, when the Raven Guard Legion had been all but broken by a monstrous act of treachery, Korax attempted to use terrible genetic alchemy to alter his chapter's gene seed and to refill his ranks with Battle Brothers, whose development into fully-fledged Space Marines had been hyper-accelerated. So disastrous were the results of this act that even the Raven Guard themselves now possess only the most allegorical accounts of what actually transpired. All other record of the resultant horror have been expunged from their records. Yet the fact remains, tragic and undeniable, that the chapter's gene seed is far from stable. It is for this reason that the Raven Guard must recruit with a slow care that has often left them under strength and dangerously stretched. 
Yet this has never held the Raven Guard back from doing their duty, instead compelling them to hone their skills as stealth warriors. In this way, they pushed themselves ever closer to perfection so that they might punish their enemies in uneven duels of shadow warfare, before finally crushing the reeling foe with rapid strikes from aerial assets, cunning scouting forces, and deadly ambushes. In the long millennia since, the Raven Guard have never faltered in their defense of humanity. They strive not for glory, not the trappings and baubles of honor and acclaim. Their purpose is that which motivated Korak since days gone by, to break humanity's chains and to rise it up to new and glorious purpose. For over 10,000 years, they have striven to see mankind's sundered worlds liberated from heresy, from Xenos, and from Tyrannus overlords most of all. Yet just as the Raven Guard cling to the shadows, so too do the shadows cling to them. Their Primarch's nature, brooding, even before the weight of hubris bore him low, is his son's or so, and they are much given to introspection that borders on self-destructive. As a chapter, they are isolationist and inscrutable, treating seldom with their brother Astartes, and then only in terms of profound need, or the most paramount of common cause, or conduct that does little to endear them to their allies. Moreover, many Raven Guard hear the whispers of the fallen, the voices growing more numerous and strident the longer they shun the light. A few even feel the icy hand of Battle Brothers long last upon their shoulder, urging them to greater efforts in the endless war for humanity's embattled soul, to forge a golden future that will bring meaning to the sacrifices of old. Only then can the chapter lay down its burden and fade into the shadows one last time. Real or imagined, the voices of the dead demand a future that cannot be, for war is the galaxy's one eternal constant. Nonetheless, they serve to drive the chapter onwards, the Raven Guard pushing forward further outwards into the bleakness of the era Indomitus, hunting the enemies of mankind as only they can. Mysterious and secretive, though the Raven Guard may be, their righteous purpose is seldom doubted by their allies. Their shadows conceal the brightest shard of the Emperor's light, granting purpose to their striving and hope to those for whom they fight. Never has that beacon been more needed than amidst the horrors of the Imperium Nihilus. Across countless worlds a new dictum has arisen, whispered as fervently as any prayer. Look to the shadows not in fear, but in hope. Deliverance Millennia after Korax's disappearance, the moon he liberated stands watch over the Forsar sector. Named Deliverance, it is as bleak and cheerless as the face the Primarch commonly wore for all save his closest comrades, and it serves as the fortress world and stronghold for his foremost inheritors. The home world of the Raven Guard is the moon Deliverance, which orbits the industrial world Kievar. Now a rare bastion of solace from the horrors of the galaxy, Deliverance was once known as Lycaeus, a prison moon whose enslaved population toiled beneath the tyrannical gaze of the tech guilds of Kievar. To Lycaeus were sent not only criminals and malcontents, but any citizens who fell foul of the guildmasters or failed to meet Kievar's exacting production quarters. Whether sentenced to labor in the, in the forced domes of the moon's airless surface, or condemned to the dark depths of its mineral mines, it was a banishment from which none returned. But when the infant Corvus Corax was found beneath Lycaea's glacial surface, the fate of its people changed forever. Sensing something miraculous in their discovery, the slaves of Lycaea raised the young Primarch in secret, naming him the Deliverer. As Corax grew quickly into his prime, the name proved fitting. He masterminded a, a campaign of insurrection that overthrew the hated Kievar overlords and broke the power of the tech guilds once and for all. In the aftermath, Kievar bent its knee to the growing Imperium, and Lycaeus was renamed Deliverance in Korax's honor. Visited in person by the Emperor of Mankind, Korax learned of his true identity as a Primarch and received command of the Raven Guard Legion, created in his image. The dark tower on deliverance that once housed Kievar's oppressors, Korax took for his own, renaming it the Raven Spire. Thus did the Raven Guard at last know a home beyond the trackless void, a home 
they have defended ever since. Unlike many chapters, the Raven Guard share close ties with the people from whom they recruit. The chapter has long drawn on the technological resources of Kievar and Deliverance, adapting many standard template constructs to suit their needs. In return, Raven Guard emissaries oversee the training of the local defense forces at the Black Chine Redoubts, a linked network of trench lines, sky fire batteries and fortresses that encircled the mining complexes and spaceports nestling on Deliverance's dark side. Though unaugmented humans cannot hope to match the combat prowess of space marines, the shadow tactics of the Raven Guard are easily adapted to the lesser troops of Deliverance. The design of the Black Chine Redoubts capitalizes on this fact, featuring a veritable maze of hidden strongpoints secret approaches and force ramparts that allow their defenders to outmaneuver the foe without giving away their own positions. Such defenses help to ensure that any force invading Deliverance would pay a heavy price in blood. This as well as the force R sector in which Deliverance is located has faced many threats, from the orcs of War Garagak to splinters of the re-emergent High Fleet Kraken. The danger has only increased since the opening of the Great Rift, and the need for Vigilant has never been greater. The Raven Spire The Raven Spire is the fortress monastery of the Raven Guard, its towering pinnacles forming a stronghold as formidable as any found in the Segmentum Tempestus. Yet, when Korax first claimed the venerable keep, he found its defences to be rotten and neglected. Drawing on tributes from the surviving tech guilds and a new influx of Imperial resources, Korax restored the Raven Spire as an adamantine bastion, bristling with weaponry fit to engage an entire enemy war fleet. More than a declaration of military might, the fortress became a symbol of the hope Korax had brought to the Kiavar system, a hope that came to define the Raven Guard themselves. Alas, with the grinding of millennia, that hope has faded much as Korax himself has all but passed into legend, and the Raven Spire's appearance echoes this malaise. Its redoubts remain inviolable, but their splendor has dulled. Towers that once shone like silver now stand corroded and brooding, and its cavernous halls and training grounds once used by thousands of battle brothers now seldom harbor more than a few hundred. Whole sections of the Raven Spire lie shrouded in dust, or else are sealed away, patrolled only by robed servitors, whose bionic limbs scrape the corridors like a warrior's death rattle. To walk in such places is to feel the presence of something distant and inexpressibly greater than oneself. Doors open and close seemingly without command, lumen-lit shrines gutter to darkness, and the stale air clogs one's lungs. It tempts to life, the rumour that the fortress itself is a thing alive, its functions guided by some ancient and arcane machine spirit birthed out of old night. But to view the Raven Spire as a decaying relic of better days would be folly. Its tarnished walls are as strong as they ever were, and its weapon batteries still promise swift death to any who would face their fury. If the fortress monastery appears outwardly faded, it is because the Raven Guards spare no thought for pomp and display. Not for them the gleaming statues, ale-sodden sagas or self congratulatory humours, honours of other chapters. Function is all, and as a training ground, stronghold and vessel of their Primarch's legacy, the Raven Spire performs every function the Sons of Koros ask of it. The tallest tower of the Raven Spire is known as the Eyrie. It was in this lofty roost that Korax made his private quarters, and few have ventured there since the Primarch left Deliverance, never to be seen again. For a full year before his departure, Korax kept himself sealed in the Eyrie, seeking absolution for the genetic horror he had unleashed upon his sons. Though it is seldom spoken of within the chapter, he was wild by the end, broken by grief and guilt. Ravengard tradition has it that Korax ultimately found his redemption in the shifting wastes of the Eye of Terror, but the veracity of this tale remains unproven. Few possess authority and courage enough to disable the eerie stasis fields and tread its dusty halls, and the lords of the chapter do so only at times of dire need, hoping to commune with an echo of Korax's departed spirit. It is impossible to say whether such an echo lingers, but all agree that a brooding presence seems to infuse the eerie. Of what guidance they do receive, no supplicant speaks. 
nor do they recount the contents of the parchments scattered about the Eerie's main chamber, saying only that they are linked with a thick black scrawl that becomes increasingly illegible as the verses themselves grow less coherent in meaning. The Forbidden Apothecarian In a labyrinth of mining tunnels deep beneath the raven spire, unknown to all but the chapter's most veteran brothers, and untrodden by any without express permission from the chapter master, lies the old apothecarian from the days of the Horus heresy. It was here that Korax's attempt to expedite the regrowth of his shattered lesion reached their full horror, birthing mutated abominations bereft of reason. When the Primarch at last realized the terrible depths of his hubris, he ordered the apothecarian abandoned and forbade all further experimentation. Then he entered its forbidden reaches alone, and personally brought the Emperor's judgment to each and every twisted failure therein. Little else is known of this time, for Korax ordered all records destroyed, but it is said that he emerged from his final visit to the apothecarian a changed being, as if a piece of his burdened soul had been ripped away for each tragic creation he killed. As for the apothecarian itself, its chambers were purged with Prometheum fire, its doors sealed shut, and a new facility in it instated elsewhere in the, in the Raven Spire. Yet the psychic fallout of their Primarch's deeds endures in the old facility, the stain of torment and betrayal ushering forth dark things from beyond reality's veil. On Far Moon Night, when Deliverance reaches its yearly apogee over Kievar, bestial howls echo through the tunnels of the old Apothecarian, the veterans of the Raven Guard's first company guard its doors. Kievar and its moon, Deliverance, are the only glittering jewels within a bleak and desolate region of space. This does not stop bold or foolish enemies from seeking out the Raven Guard home system and launching raids upon it, of course. Kievar's hives are abundant with manufactured riches and burgeoning populations, while both Raban and Rubar play host to gas mining and refinery facilities that hang in their upper atmospheres. The Raven Guard show no mercy to those who invade their domain. No foe has ever survived the attempt. Chapter Organization For all their isolationism, the Raven Guard looked to the wisdom of the Codex Astartes to shape their organizational structure. Where some Primarchs viewed this great treatise of Rabut Gilliman with suspicion, Korax was swift to adopt its teachings, viewing them as a means by which his diminished lesion might yet flourish. It was a decision that is respected still. Few chapters beside the Ultramarines follow the dictates of the Codex Astartes more closely than the Raven Guard, refusing even the alterations to an aspirant's path through the reserve companies that some other chapters have adopted over the millennia. The Raven Guard maintained Gulliman's template in immaculate form, and making exception only at times of great need. As decreed by the Codex, the Raven Guard arrayed themselves in ten companies, each with an official strength of one hundred battle brothers, and each led by a commander known as a Shadow Captain. Supplementing these forces are the specialist warriors of the chapter, apothecarians, chaplains, and librarians, and the venerable war engines of the armory. The Lord of the Raven Guard is the chapter master, typically known by the ancient rank Master of Shadows. More conscious of their finite resources than most chapters, the Raven Guard rarely deployed the might of a full company in a single sledgehammer blow. More often, they rely on autonomous, fast-moving strike forces known as Talons, which can consist of as few as one or two squads and their supporting strike vehicles. Dispersed in this way, a single Raven Guard company can prosecute campaigns across multi-planetary battle zones, its warriors wreaking havoc from the shadows before regrouping to execute a final killing strike. The flexibility of these talents enables the Raven Guard to rapidly pool their assets, forming larger detachments as needed, which can be just as quickly dissolved when new objectives arise. So swift are such redeployments that foes are apt to overestimate the Raven Guard's numbers, a misjudgment compounded by the chapter's habit of altering their battlefield heraldry to sow confusion and cloak the true disposition of their forces. 
Despite the fluidity of Raven Guard deployments, the company structure is central to the way the chapter marshals its resources, and each company forms up to the blueprints laid down by the Codex Astartes. Consequently, the first company of the Raven Guard consists of the chapter's most experienced warriors, known as veterans. They have triumphed through decades or even centuries of unremitting war. Much as a single Raven Guard battle brother is worth a dozen less for fighters, it is claimed that a first company veteran is the equal of many less seasoned battle brothers. Accordingly, they are most commonly deployed squad by squad to reinforce the operations of other companies. The second to fifth companies are the chapter's battle companies. These comprise a versatile combination of battle line, close support and fire support squads, equipping each shadow captain with a broad range of tactical tools. Whether sending their full battle company to war or dividing their forces into smaller, more specialised deployments to meet threats of diverse kinds. As befits a chapter dedicated to swift, stealthy warfare, the primary space marines of the Raven Guard's battle companies often go to war in Phobos armour, its more lightweight design affording maximum agility. Taken with the chapter's long-standing preference for Mark VI Corvus power armour, with its distinctive beaked helms, the prevalence of Phobos armour does much to give the warriors of the Raven Guard battle companies a sleek, predatory appearance. Like all Codex-compliant chapters, the 6th to 9th companies are the Raven Guard's reserve companies, capable combat forces in themselves. It falls to these brethren to reinforce battle companies whose ranks become depleted. Except in the most remarkable circumstances, a neophyte elevated to the rank of full battle brother will progress through each of the reserve companies, mastering the breadth of tactics and weapons he will one day be called upon to wield in a battle company. Fighting in the fire support squads of the 9th Company, he absorbs the precepts of target priority and how to marshal heavy weaponry in the Emperor's name. In close support squads of the 8th Company, he learns to channel his ferocity to better overwhelm the foe at close quarters. By the time a battle brother has passed through the tactical reserve of the 7th and 6th Companies, he has acquired all of the individual skills expected of a space marine. All that remains is to hone and temper them, balancing firepower with fury, as each situation demands. The Tenth Company is where neophyte battle brothers are first schooled in their chapter's traditions and combat doctrines. Compared to its equivalents in other chapters, the Raven Guard's Tenth Company is notable for the lengthy period of service aspirants must complete before progressing to the reserve companies. Known as the Subtle, the warriors of the Tenth may spend upwards to ten years practicing the arts of infiltration and sabotage, until they are deemed ready to receive the Black Carapace. This company also serves as the chapter's forward reconnaissance and assassination cadre, cadre, for it is here that the 100 strong Primaris Vanguard force is based ready to strike at the chapter's foes. Prolonged training in the 10th company also serves a further purpose, with supplies of Raven Guard gene seed remaining precipitously low. The chapter scrutinizes every new recruit to an unusual degree, ensuring that each is a worthy addition to the chapter. Led by the Master of Shadows, the commanders of the Raven Guard are charged with marshalling the Raven Spire's fighting strength, upholding the teachings of Korax, and safeguarding their chapter's precious gene seed. The Lords of the Raven Guard operate with even greater autonomy than their counterparts in many other chapters. While the word of the Master of Shadows is inviolate, those who serve beneath him are encouraged to act wholly on their own initiative until such word is given. Some chapters would consider this unconventional approach to be a step towards anarchy, but it has served the Raven Guard well through the tumultuous millennia. Where other forces might experience disruption of the death of their leader, there is always another amongst the Raven Guard's self-sufficient shadow captains ready to assume the mantle of command. This philosophy extends throughout the Raven Guard command structure. Chaplains, librarians and tech marines are all expected to operate intuitively in battle, acting on hunch and instinct, as Chorus himself once did. Necessity ensures that a strike force rarely enters battle without a chaplain's spiritual guidance or a tech marine's knack for soothing a wounded machine, but the precise details of such arrangements are seldom imposed from above. Only apothecaries are officially assigned, in light of the chapter's tumultuous past, Every effort is taken to preserve what stocks of gene seed remain by retrieving the progenoid organs of the honored dead. 
Indeed, the Raven Guard maintain a slightly higher complement of apothecaries to ensure that when a battle by the fools, a reductor's metallic armatures are never far away. While theoretically the Master of Shadows takes counsel from his shadow captains and senior members of the Reclusium, Liberius, Apothecarian and Armory, in practice it is rare for all to be gathered in the same place. When Caven Shrike called the conclave at which he scattered his battle brothers across the Imperium, it was the first such meeting held within the Raven Svar's gloomy halls for nearly two centuries. The Raven Guard are as restless in nature as any fleet-based chapter, and their leaders are little inclined towards discourse when action carries greater meaning. Nonetheless, in purpose, the Raven Guard remain as tight-knit a brotherhood as any to be found across the embattled Imperium, bound not only by the legacy of Korax's flesh, his unquenchable desire to see mankind delivered from darkness. That they will take whatever steps they must to accomplish their mission remains no less true for going unspoken. The Rites of Shadow All Space Marine chapters have their own rituals accumulated across boundless centuries, and the Raven Guard are no different. Most honour the lost Primarch of the Emperor himself, a distant and aloof figure, more akin to a stern patriarch than deity in the Raven Guard's traditions. Other rituals mirror ceremonies conducted across the Imperium, varying only slightly from those practiced by a thousand warrior cults. But the rites of shadow are unique to the Raven Guard and their successors. Preserved since the time of the Great Crusade, these fragments of mystery and wonder teach that shadow contains both trust and lies. The purpose of each rite is, is the separation of one from the other, and the glimpsing of verities otherwise hidden about one's battle brothers, one's cause, or even one's foes. The rites of shadow are conducted entirely in silence, using the gestures of course spake to sign the traditional questions and answer to each ceremony. The crowfane, the feast of bones, the empty chime, even the murder call, which calls for vengeance against the slayer of a great hero and can only be performed while battle yet rages, all are conducted without words, their secrets hidden from onlookers by a veil of silence. Overseeing such rituals is the responsibility of the chapter's shadow captains as much as their chaplains, for they walk in shadow no less so than the keepers of the Raven Spire's mysteries. The use of shadow to prefix rank marks out a battle brother who has mastered the rites of shadow along with the trifold path, and therefore shares the deepest connection with the Primarch. None can rise to the rank of captain without such mastery, but the rank is not itself a prerequisite any battle brother can earn shadow status once his qualities are proven. Indeed, this much is common amongst the ranks of the second company, the Shadowborn. These warriors are greatly respected by the rest of the chapter, but command no status that rank does not bestow. To walk as one with shadow is a powerful gift, but even in the Raven Guard there is no su substitute for proven leadership ability. At the heart of the Raven Spire nests, the armory, where the chapter's battle tanks, gunships, weapons and warsuits are maintained in a state of constant readiness by tech marines and a toiling army of servitors. The armory holds the chapter's history and future both, and is thus a place of great spiritual significance to the sons of Korax. The cataclysm of the Horus Heresy dealt a terrible blow to the Raven Guard's fighting strength, ravaging not only their warriors' numbers, but also their armory. During the massacre at Istvan V, an appalling amount of the Legion's material and armor was destroyed or abandoned, forcing the Raven Guard and their successors to rely on older marks of armor and weaponry for many centuries afterwards. Through long years of toil and manufactorums and techsmiths of Kiev are eventually repairing these shortages, but the signs of strife remain. Many of the armory's oldest assets still bear the wounds of time-lost battles, treasured scars of Istavan, Ptolemos, and Carine, preserved for all to see. Nonetheless, at times such battle damage must be reversed to serve the needs of war. However esteemed, distinctive marks can easily betray a vehicle attempting to obfuscate its true identity. Unmaking these scars is almost a sorrowful task for the artificers of the Raven Guard, and one they perform with heavy hearts. That the chapter allows this at all is testament to their belief in pragmatism over pomp. The most ancient war machines of the Raven Guard seldom emerge from shadow. 
They are preserved in the deepest vaults of the armory and readied only in times of direst need, as the spirits of old roused to aid the deeds of the living. The Raven Guard believe that their slain are not lost forever, but wait within the shadow that no light can pierce, judging the deeds and failures of their inheritors. By bearing the armory's venerable heirlooms back into the fires of war, the sons of Korax invite their ancestors to take note that the chapter's cause is still upheld by worthy warriors. For this reason, do the Raven Guard venerate Dreadnought's sarcophagi above all other relics, for such marvels permit the honored dead to fight alongside the living, even while having one foot deep in the shadow. For all its old ghosts, the armory remains a rare hive of activity within the gloom-shrouded Ravenspire. Each battle brings fresh wounds to storied armor that must be unmade, armaments and adamantine plating of war engines must be repaired, and the machine spirits appeased. The war gear of Fallen Brothers is painstakingly restored, ready to serve their successor in the chapter's endless battle. Thus does the armory blaze with light and fire even when all else is swallowed by silence, the strike of hammer and the roar of furnace, a rededication to a war that will never end. Rise of the Raven Guard From the very first, the 19th Legion that would one day become the Raven Guard displayed a talent for hidden warfare. The sons of Korax would range ahead of unfolding campaigns, weakening the enemy through sabotage and infiltration. Thus did many a foe wake to find the legion's talons already at their throat. Their war ended almost before it had even begun. The precise scope of the 19th Legion's contribution to the early days of unification and the Great Crusade that followed remains shrouded in mystery, for the Legion was, was little given to trumpeting its achievements. Records from that time are incomplete at best, and those pertaining to the 19th are often fragmented to the point of incoherence. Indeed, many bear signs of having been willfully redacted or expunged or of detail, perhaps at the behest of the Emperor himself, or those closest to him. Even the store of records maintained by the modern-day chapter are notably silent on the earliest years, where ordinarily they would be revered as proud lineage. It is not recorded if such reticence arose out of the Legion's stoic character, or out of necessity. The Emperor's wishing to keep the hidden hand of the 19th concealed from those against whom it was deployed. However, it is certain that the Legion's roster of early battle honours is better inferred by absence than confirmation. Victories won without obvious cause, or in secrecy so absolute that not even a whisper remains. Nonetheless, those fragments that survived suggest that the early Legion was much different in temperament to the chapter it later became. The Emperor recruited the 19th chiefly from the Zeric tribesmen of the Asiatic dust fields, and the first legionaries were, were notable for an ingrained and bellicose cruelty. Zeric culture demanded that a predatory vigil be kept over bested foes, lest they again rise up in defiance of their conquerors. The 19th Legion folded this tradition into their core doctrines, practicing clandestine observation of those they defeated, watching from the shadows for any hint of recidivism and striking anew without mercy upon its manifestation. During the early years of the Great Crusade, the 19th often fought alongside Horus's lunar wolves. The fatherless leisure granted the guidance and example of the Imperium's foremost Primarch whilst their own gene sire was lost to the caprices of fate. This partnership proved highly effective, the 19th's flair for unmaking the enemy from within, complementing the overwhelming assaults favoured by the Lunar Wolves. Before long, Horus and his sons came to value the cold-eyed warriors of the Wastes. Indeed, it is possible that many of the future Warmaster's early victories owed as much to the inscrutable 19th Legion as to his own Chthonic warriors. But the 19th's tendency towards secrecy and Horus's own fulsome pride makes such speculation murky at best. Upon Korax's unification with his sons, much of the Legion's cold Zeric demeanor was purged. The Primarch's upbringing amidst the slave mines of Lacaeus had left an indelible mark on his character and he swiftly developed a profound intolerance of the 19th's oppressive and merciless ways. The traditions and rituals of the Zeric tribes were decreed anathema, replaced by rites of shadow instigated by Korax's own hand, 
and a great many officers were removed from command or otherwise marginalized. Amongst the deposed was Lord Arcus Fowl, who had commanded the 19th some 30 years prior to Korax's ascension. Fowl and many like him were quietly assigned to nomad predation fleets and dispatched to the fringes of the Imperium as exiles in all but name. Rumors abound of these fleets siding with the Warmaster when grand, tra when grand tragedy struck, but no such betrayal has been confirmed, and the true fate of these officers stripped of command may never be known. With obstacles removed and a fresh influx of recruits from Korax's adopted homeworld of Lycaeus, renamed Deliverance, the Primarch's efforts to reshape the 19th Legion accelerated. Though the newly titled Raven Guard retained their reputation for swift, uncompromising warfare, their course became one of liberation and redemption, as Korax strove to lift other worlds out of bondage as he had done for deliverance itself. Korax reformed not only his Legion's character, but also its doctrines. He pursued the arts of shadow obsessively, showing all he had learned with the Raven Guard until their mastery of warfare's subtler methods was unparalleled in the Emperor's sight. To aid in this, Korax swelled the Raven Guard's armory with technological marvels crafted by the tech guilds of Kievar. Chief amongst these were retrofitted assault craft designed for swift and undetectable insertion behind enemy lines, as well as cunningly wrought sonic baffles to aid warriors in moving with no sound. Created without the oversight of Mars, these innovations served to forge a bond between the Raven Guard and Kiovar, even as they risked that planet's isolation from the distant Martian priesthood. Through these deeds, Korax came as close to con contentment as so introspective a soul can, for the Raven Guard had grown to become a reflection of himself and a unique asset in the Emperor's Great Crusade. In the dying days of the Great Crusade, the first of two grievous blows fell upon the Raven Guard. During the liberation of the Akum Sothos cluster, Warmaster Horus ordered Korax's legion to make a frontal assault against the fortress known as Gate 42, a fateful engagement later commemorated as Ravenfall by the Raven Guard themselves. Korax argued against this squandering of lives, but his suggested strategy of misdirection won no support. When Petrarbu and Lehman Russ sided with Horus, Korax had li little choice but to launch the assault. As Korax had foreseen, the Raven Guard suffered greatly before the defender's guns. Though Horus gloried in the battle as a victory of his engineering, the losses of the Raven Guard left them the smallest of the legions, a fact that would help to tip the scales in the rebellion to come. Yet Korax, evincing considerable foresight, had found a way to bend tragedy to purpose. Knowing the cost that the assault would levy, he coldly saw to it that the brunt was borne by the most bellicose and fractious of his sons the scions of the Zeric tribes, rather than those native to deliverance. Thus the legion that emerged from the horror of Ravenfall was a fighting force more disciplined than ever before, its warriors more closely aligned with the Primarch's own aims and strategic visions. Furthermore, the slaughter at Gate 42 had excised from the Raven Guard most of those who had venerated Horus. In the dark years that followed, this fact placed the legion further from the Warmaster's clutches. Yet none of this would make the Raven Guard immune to the approaching consequences of Horus's pride. Scant years later, the War Master would succeed in all but exterminating the sons of Korax. Corvus Korax, the Raven Lord. The Great Crusade had raged for more than a century before the 19th Legion was finally reunited with its lost Primarch. As with his Legion, the Primarch's formative years, and indeed many of his later deeds, are steeped in mystery and preserved in little detail even in the Raven Guard's own histories. Accounts of the Raven Lord's remarkable abilities survive more as rumours than recorded fact. It is known that he possessed a preternatural aptitude for stealth, but whether that ability sprung from the unconscious expression of some psychic gift or a benevolent mutation that can only be guessed at. However, Korax's snow-white skin and inky black eyes certainly seem to suggest oddities in his genetic makeup. Korax has also been credited with a foresight bordering on precognition. Certainly, he had a knack for seeing the shape of the future before it unfolded, a gift that some scholars have ascribed to a supernatural source, but others wonder at Korax's first meeting with his father, a conclave held in utmost privacy and at considerable length, speculating what might have passed between them. 
Had the emperor himself possessed foreknowledge of how his grand design would unfold, did he forewarn Korax of the bleak times to come? Such secrets are lost to those faded years, but most reject this theory. Had the emperor been armed with knowledge of later events, he would surely have done many things differently in the days of the Great Crusade. By far the most common belief is that a man as observant as Korax would glimpse many fleeting truths that others miss and act upon them. This conclusion would seem to be borne out by the Primarch's sons, for while there is little evidence of precognition among the Raven Guard of the 41st millennium, it is rare for the chapter to be caught off guard or to indicate any surprise at unfolding events. Massacre at Istvan V At the outbreak of the Horus Heresy, the Raven Guard remained steadfastly loyal to the Emperor and his vision for mankind. For this they paid a heavy price, becoming one of three legions brutalized in the dropside massacre at Istvan V, the bloody prologue to a civil war that would shake the Imperium to its very foundations. History does not record whether Horus, at the outset of his treachery, sought the loyalty of Korax in person as he did with many of his brother Primarchs. The slaughter of Raven's Fall had driven the two men apart seemingly irrevocably, Korax swearing in a moment of rare anger never to serve beneath Horus again. Yet it seems doubtful that Horus made no effort to seduce the 19th Legion, for his regard for their abilities remained undimmed. Twisting the Raven Guard to the traitor cause would have been no small coup, for their propensity for shadow warfare would have added greatly to the Warmaster's arsenal. Nevertheless, what overtures were attempted, if any, must remain a matter of speculation. What is known is that Korax was swift to set aside other duties in response to the atrocities of Estvan III. Receiving Rogaldorn's urgent astrotelepathic communication, Korax dispatched some 80,000 Raven Guard to the Istvan system. While Korax's legion had yet to replenish the losses suffered at Ravenfall, it yet remained a fearsome instrument of war, and amongst the most valuable cards in Dawn's tarot. Korax held back a mere thousand troops to safeguard deliverance against an increasingly uncertain future. In all, Dawn unleashed eight legions to crush Horus and the three traitor Primarchs who were declared for his cause eight legions against four, and those four sorely depleted after purging the loyalists from their ranks. Such a display of force should have ended the unfolding rebellion before it had truly begun, crushing the traitors beneath a hammer blow of unstoppable might. Alas, not all was as it seemed. The Night Lords, Iron Warriors, Word Bearers, and Alpha Legion came to Istvan not to unmake Horus, but to rally to his banner. The Imperial Fists were sundered from their brethren by the roiling perils of the Immaterium. Thus, by the time the punitive fleet arrived at Istvan V, only three Loyalist legions remained. Under the tempestuous command of Ferris Manus, and supported by elements of the Imperial Army, the Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamander legions led the first assault on Horus's positions. Words can do little justice to the slaughter of those opening hours in which the desolate fields offered up a grim harvest of corpses. A thousand heroes and villains were forged, only to be ground into the blooded waste within moments of their striking. Inch by bloody inch, Ferris Manus led his iron hands directly into the searing storm of traitor fire, gaining ground by righteous and stubborn fury, as much as by force of arms. Gorax pressed the assault on the right flank, while Vulcan salamanders weathered the diseased horrors on the left. That the other four legions arrived late and took up fortified positions at the Loyalists' rear should perhaps have indicated that something was terribly amiss. However, amongst the blood-soaked confusion, even Korax missed the warnings of the coming disaster. Instead, he read his misgivings as echoes of the tragedy of Gate 42, for the two battles had similarities beyond the superficial. When the traitorous reinforcements attacked, they did so without hesitation or mercy. The Raven Guard, under strength before the battle, had even begun, and now desperately short of ammunition, found themselves assailed by the might of not one, but two traitor legions fresh to the battle. 
even as Freyr's Manus fell to a decapitating stroke from Fulgrim's traitorous blade, and the Night Lords pressed in against Korax's undefended northern flank, the word bearers overran the Raven Guard drop zone in a frenzied tide of fratricidal bloodletting that made a mockery of any savagery that had been displayed before. Something broke within Korax at that moment. He flung himself at the newcomers in counter assault, reaping a fearsome tally of chanting word bearers before coming face to face with the, their insidious Primarch, Lorgar, and leaving him grievously wounded. That Lorgar survived at all was only through the intervention of the Night Lord's Primarch, Conrad Kurz, whose sudden onslaught left Korax little choice but to flee or perish with his doomed legion. On the Raven Guard fought, even as their ammunition ran dry and the strength faded from each swing of claw and chainsword. Survival, not victory, was now their goal. Ferris Manus and his iron hands were gone. Vulcan was missing, and the salamanders overrun. Burning with shame and rage, Korax gathered what survivors he could and breached the traitor's perimeter. As his enemies greeted the descending night and with howls of victory, Korax slipped away and swore vengeance against those who had once been his brothers. Though ragged and broken in number, his legion would fight on. The battle had been lost, but the war raged on. Of the 80,000 Raven Guard who had would come to Istvan to quell rebellion, perhaps two or three thousand warriors remained. Nonetheless, for a seemingly impossible 80 days and nights, Korax led the fugitive survivors in a campaign of sabotage and ambush that gouged great wounds in the traitor's collective hide. They waylaid armoured convoys and brought slaughter to those seeking to defile the honoured dead. They disrupted heretical rituals of the darkest kind and butchered roving warbands. But such defiance could not be sustained. Cut off from outward aid and outnumbered many times over, the Raven Guard found themselves at the centre of a closing snare. At the last, with pursuers closing in on all sides and all hope lost, aid arrived from far off deliverance. As the traitor's noose seemed set to close round Korax's throat, a fleet of dropships screamed down from the tortured skies and spirited the Primarch and his weary survivors away from Istvan V. The Raven Guard had teetered on the brink, but they would endure, and they would remember. Although his once mighty legion now numbered but a few sparse thousands, Korax had determined that it should play its part in the Horus's downfall. The Primarch longed to avenge his fallen sons and seek recompense against the perpetrators of the Dropsite Massacre. Alas, so heavy had been the losses of gene seed and material, as well as legionary lives, that to rejoin the quickening conflict would have been to risk the Raven Guard's very existence. Gorax undertook desperate measures, seeking to replenish his losses at a greatly accelerated rate. He strove to replicate the genetic process by which the Emperor had first created the Adeptus Astartes. Successes were few and fleeting. The true Space Marines outnumbered many times over by twisted abominations. Few of the Primarch's creations could even grip a bolt gun, and all were insane, their minds twisted apart by the flawed and forbidden procedure. Though these measures enabled the Draven Guard to play some further part in the unfolding heresy, the Legion's gene seed would never again recover. Korax's spirit, wearied by disaster and defeat, was finally shattered by the foul consequence of his striving. Still, the Raven Guard fought on. Even under strength and lacking supplies, their particular skills allowed them to contribute to the Emperor's cause where others would surely have failed. No longer able to serve as the anchor point of assaults or defenses in large-scale actions, they fell back on the stratagems that had served them so well in the Great Crusade, striking from the shadows unseen and unlooked for. Thus husbanded, the legion's numbers slowly recovered. Yet as the Horus heresy escalated, the Raven Guard and their Primarch were forced into the shadows in every sense, reduced to fighting ancillary battles while the fate of the galaxy unfolded elsewhere. So lasting were the Raven Guard's wounds that in the era of the Second Founding, when the legions of old were broken up into chapters, only four arose from the ranks of the 19th, the Black Guard, the Revilers, the Raptors, and the Raven Guard themselves. As for Korax, he never truly recovered from the horrors he had inflicted on his sons. Driven mad by grief and desperate for absolution, there could be no one's gift but his own. He departed deliverance for a destination unknown. End quote. 
So we have seen the pitiless tragedy that has been the existence of the Raven Guard. Yet they have endured. Yet they have never given in to doubt or misery or self-pity. I honestly believe that in the Raven Guard we see the true nature of the best in humanity, some of its best qualities. To adapt to the circumstances that the fickle and fractious mistress called fate has dealt them. To rise from adversity and dust themselves off and to move forward. To always fight for the community which they defend. To never, ever surrender. The Raven God has always been few in number, but yet their contribution has always matched that of other legions, even though they have been broken down into chapters. For the blood of Korax is one thing, and it is strong. But what is more resilient, more powerful even than his genetic gifts to his son, are his teachings. Not for the Raven Guard are the klaxons of victory, the trumpeted clarion calls to witness their virtue. Theirs is the private satisfaction, but the deed well done, and done well, for its own sake. The lives they save, the souls they redeem and protect, and the countering of the diverse evils in the galaxy. In the Raven Guard there is a fire that burns silently and constantly, a one that can never be extinguished and how they will change in the near future, or potentially so. How things have moved on in the very plotline of the Warhammer setting, for Corvus Corax has been spotted, has been witnessed in the warp. For like his sons, he has endured the long millennia of the Imperium, has never laid down his sword, never faltered from his quest. He has been in the warp hunting his brothers who turned traitor. But he has learned, and he has mutated, has evolved, has changed. In Korax, we see the proof that the Primarchs are as much creatures of the warp as the Neverborn. Parts of them were ever magical and inexplicable, their charisma, their power, and it was never just their size or quantifiable attributes or genetics. For Korax has changed so very much in his time. He is now like a specter of evil, a dark shadow that can change from corporeal solidity into an inky shadow and back again in the blink of an immortal eye. But yet he fights for light. He has remained loyal, despite ten millennia in the warp. Unimaginable courage. And when he returns, when he finally chases his brethren into the Materium, perhaps he will rejoin his sons and lead them once again. If this is so, then perhaps he can unlock the gifts he inherited, and may have passed on to his sons in some small part. In the Raven Guard, the very night may be the thing that the rebels and traitors may yet learn to fear, more so even than the ire of their own dark gods. For when Corvax Corax returns, then each traitor, high or low, had better look under their bed each night. For the shadows are his to command, and they are his domain, and he will strike from any with impunity bringing the fear of the night to those who claim to be its masters.